Good morning. I want to invite you to stand one more time for a scripture reading. We're going to be in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, and verse starting with verse 40. Uh, before I read, I want to thank uh, the church uh, for praying for me when I went to Portugal a couple weeks ago to visit my mom, and, and even for helping with the airline ticket. Those last-minute tickets are very pricey. But it was good to be with her. She's very weak and very frail, but she's hanging in there and uh, trusting the Lord for his perfect timing and also for a new glorified body. That's his promise for us. Um, Luke chapter 8 and verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And failing and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living with physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that the power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling. And falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not tra trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear. Only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James, and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Moses. Well, you may be wondering, and maybe you aren't, but why I'm wearing a white tie today. Um, sometimes I have a reason for why I wear a tie. Sometimes it's because a certain team is doing better than another team. And so I want to make sure that you all are aware of that. Sometimes I should be wearing a black tie. But anyways, uh, what a white tie represents on Father's Day is uh, the fact that my father no longer is alive. Um, and if somebody wore a red, that would be a representation that their father was still alive. Um, how the, the idea of um, Father's Day came about, there was a lady named Sonora Dodd, and this was early in the 1900s. She's actually sitting in a church listening to a Mother's Day message, and she thought, hmm... I think something should be done for dads. Uh, what had happened was her mom had died pretty much after she had been born, and her father is the one who stepped in and did the job. And she was so blessed by that that she pushed for that. And as a result, um, by the time you got to Calvin Coolidge, he's the one, I think, that declared it a, a holiday um, as something that we look to, at least in our country. 
And so what would happen is on that day, people would hand out uh, red roses to the fathers that were there represented, and then people would pin on a white rose uh, if their father had passed away. And so I wear this in honor of my father uh, this morning. Wanted to help you ladies out. That's I'm here to help. That's what I do. And uh, some of you may think, you know, you've heard the line before, I just don't understand women. I can say that. Um, but, I don't under, uh, but I can also say that there's sometimes that I hear from women that they don't understand men. And so I want to be, be a help. And so I looked up uh, what certain phrases mean in the men's thesaurus. And so I want to help you out. I want to help you out. And so, yeah, I know you're right, Bill. You're right. So here's what it means. So it help you out. And, and if this gets any of you in trouble, have at it. All right. Um, when a man says it won't take too long to, it would take too long to explain, he means I have no idea how it works. <laughs> when a man says, take a break, honey, you are working too hard. He means, I can't hear the game over the vacuum cleaner. Okay. When a man says it's a guy thing, he means there is no rational thought pattern connected with this, and you have no chance at all of making it logical. When a man says, can I help with dinner, he means, why isn't it ready yet? Oh, it gets better. When a man says, uh-huh, sure, honey, or yes, dear, he means absolutely nothing. <laughs> it's a conditioned response. When a man says, you know how bad my memory is. I know Moses has said this to me before even. You know how bad my memory is. He means I can remember the theme song to Hogan's Heroes, the phone number of the first girl I ever kissed, and the vehicle identification number of every car I ever owned, but yes, I forgot your birthday. <laughs> when a man says, oh, don't fuss, I just cut myself, it's no big deal, he means, I have probably severed a limb, but I will bleed to death before I admit I'm hurt, so get over here and help me. <laughs> when a man says, I can't find it, he means, it didn't fall into my outstretched hand, so I'm completely <laughs> clueless. When a man says, you look terrific, he means, oh, please don't try on one more outfit. We're late and I'm starving. <laughs> Just a few more. When a man says, I'm not lost, I know exactly where we are, he means no one will ever see us alive again. <laughs> when a man says, I don't remember saying that, it, it's because he means anything I may have said six months ago is inadmissible in an argument. In fact, all past comments become null and void after seven days. Okay. And then, and this is a crucial one, ladies. When a man says, that's not what I meant, he means if something I said can be interpreted in two ways, and one of the ways makes you sad or angry, I meant the other one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> The men's thesaurus. So you can get that into your hands and turn to whatever when he says it. All right. Hey, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for a, a, a beautiful day and an opportunity to spend some time in your word together. We'd ask you, God, that this story, uh, that is a true story, that is an inspired uh, text that we've read from this morning, that as a result of this time together, that, Lord, you'd help us. Help us as men. Help us as um, family members, as friends, this body of Christ, uh, that we would be what we ought to be in the power of Christ. You've got to help us. So thank you again for this opportunity to be together. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I hope you have your Bible opened to Luke chapter 8 as Moses had uh, read this to us. And as we work through this, um, point number one is this. And this is a challenge to men, but it's also the challenge to you ladies as you watch the men and you pray for men. Uh, but first thing is be unashamed to seek Jesus. Men, be unashamed to seek Jesus. Fathers, be unashamed to seek Jesus. Look at verses 40 and 41 again. 
Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him, which is a great thing. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet. Okay, we'll leave it there. He's a ruler of the synagogue. Jairus is called a ruler of the synagogue. The Greek word is archon. There were different roles of, of different people that were in the synagogue. This is the highest ranking spiritual official in town. Uh, the town was Capernaum. Uh, he would be the one who supervised worship, worship in the synagogue. He would plan the worship service. Uh, he chose who it would be that would read the scrolls of Scripture. Um, he picked out who gave the message that day. And so... He was well known. He's a big deal. Um, he's highly esteemed. Uh, he's very religious. And he may have also been a Pharisee. And you can see how there would be a tension in that. If he's a Pharisee and the Pharisees are a group of people that don't like Jesus, the tension of him going to see Jesus, him seeing a need to see Jesus, he may have been the one that saw Jesus cast out a demon uh, out of a man in the synagogue. He may have uh, been the one that had seen or heard about different miracles that Jesus had accomplished, and he had been pushed to the place where he's got a sick little girl. Now think about that. Just relate to that for a little bit. When our children hurt, we hurt. I think I've heard this line. You're only as, so, you're only as happy as your least happy child. And, uh, boy, he's desperate. Uh, he's a dad with a dying girl. He'll do anything. And so there's an irony of this synagogue ruler's willingness to go and uh, falling at Jesus' feet. What a picture. Whatever his importance, whatever his status, whatever his standing, he's desperate. He's got this little girl, this sweet little girl, 12-year-old, that's at a point of death. So what's he do? He overcomes any pride, any prejudice, and he goes and sees Jesus. Notice that he goes to Jesus. He doesn't send his wife doesn't go, you know, you're into this church stuff or you're into this God stuff. I know I'm the ruler, but I, I, how would it be if I went? Why don't you go? He doesn't send a servant. He doesn't even send a friend. He himself goes to seek after Jesus. And notice that he doesn't do it at night like Nicodemus. He's going at daytime, and he's going when a bunch of people are around. Isn't it interesting that we get to the point where we see the need, and we're willing to take that step, and that's where he's at. Look at this. Even in, It's even stronger in Matthew. All Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, all talk about this. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18 while he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And so he's, he is like having such faith. He's in her, in his mind, she's already died, but that didn't stop him. He hasn't given up. He's willing to, to worship Jesus. Let me challenge you men for a moment. We are called by God to be the spiritual leaders in our home. Whether you realize it or not, you're either leading your family close to God or you're leading them farther away. It doesn't work in a middle ground there. Socrates said this. Listen to what he said to a generation. He said, Why do you turn and scrape every stone to find wealth, but take so little care of the children to whom one day you will relinquish it all? So if this pagan philosopher felt this way, what does that say to us? 
Isn't it interesting as we look at Ephesians chapter 6? Look at this, Ephesians 6. Look at how he works through what is called the calling of a family. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And then look at the, the switch here. Fathers. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Isn't it interesting that he does that? You would think he would say, children, blah, 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 blah. And then he'd go, parents. But he puts the onus on us as dads. Now, why is that the case? Why just dads? Why does he say that there? Well, maybe they neglect it more. Maybe sometimes we can come across as harsh. Sometimes I'll watch how my wife says something and I'll say something and I'm going, boy, I I could have said it a little more like her and it would have come across better. Or maybe it's because we're called to lead in the home. It's a partnership, obviously. Most moms are spending a load of time with their children. And here's what the Lord is saying to us. Step up, men. James Dobson said this. He said, the Western world stands at a great crossroads in its history. It is my opinion that our very survival as a people will depend on the presence or absence of masculine leadership in the home. You guys know how Bob Spoonster was dear to me. And Bob had a few lines that we would hear over and over and over again, okay? And we didn't seem to grow tired of it because it was Bob. And he would constantly talk about jail ministry. I don't know, like, it seemed like that phrase was attached to a lot of sentences for him, okay? Well, in the jail, I do this and stuff like that. And something that he would point out regularly is how jail what's who's in there a big reason is because of what their dad was like it's our calling men you see the cure for crime is even more than the electric chair it's the high chair and fathers have involvement in that in the words of eugene peterson he says it's a long obedience in the same direction it's the hard stuff. It's, it's the willingness to do the hard thing. So, as I pray and try to get your attention, I'm saying, be unashamed to seek Jesus. This dad was. Let's keep going. Point number two. Bring Jesus home bring Jesus home. Look at, it continues on the second part of verse 41. Well, let me read the whole verse again. And there came a man named Jairus who was a ruler in the synagogue and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. So he wants to bring Jesus home because he has this little girl that he loves and he wants things working out for her. He wants her to be alive. He, she's only 12. Look at verse 42, and then we've got a, and it says 42, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Now, before he gets home, though, I want you, because I've preached through this when we work through Luke, that this is the only time in the scriptures where there is a miracle in the middle of a miracle, okay, sandwiched in there. But I want you to, for a moment, Realize that we're going to get back to this dad, but something is going on, and he's watching this. So think about this. He says to Jesus, please come to my house. He falls asleep. Please come to my house. My daughter's dying. I, I just, I need you. I know you're the man that can take care of this. In the midst of a crowd, we find out a little bit more about him, but then another story takes place. So look at this, and think about it as a dad watching this go on. Your daughter's sick. Some of, you know, some, 
she's dying or she's dead. Where it's at right now, we're not exactly sure. But we do know this, that he's hurting. And, he would, and I don't know about you, but if you've ever been in an emergency room and everybody and their mother seems to be getting called and you aren't, it's horrible. Okay? And this is where he's at in an emergency room, which is a big crowd, and he's making his way. Okay? Look at these verses here. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And so Jairus was probably part of that. You don't know how long where it got to the point where he was distant from him, but he's still trying to stay with him because basically he's trying to get him to get to his house. And there is a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Now, I want you to think about that, the, the irony of that for a moment. His daughter's 12 and this lady's been six since she is 12. Now, you ever think about that in your life with different things? The other day, John and I had an opportunity to go to the hospital together. And I said, what year did you graduate from high school? And I'm going to tell him, John. All right. It's out. And there's other secrets I'm going to tell throughout the whole sermon. No, I'm just kidding. So, but 1975. And when he told me that, here's what I did immediately. I was graduating from eighth grade, 1975. And so this, I'm this little kid growing up in Chicago. And literally, this is what's going through my mind as you're telling me. I'm still listening to you, but I'm thinking to myself, I'm in Chicago, and I'm an eighth grader. He's in Washington, Missouri, graduating from there. And at some point, we're going to be able to be in a car together going on a hospital visit. Different lives going on, different things going on. And so this lady who seems to be healthy, back to the Bible here, this lady who seems to be healthy, was it the day? I don't know. But at a certain point around the time when this guy is having his one and only daughter, a day of celebration, she gets sick. And for 12 years, he's been experiencing the joys of having this daughter in his life, just all the different things, teaching how to ride a bike down a hill, a burn pile, I don't know. But whatever, they got, all the different things she lived. You know. um, but it is one of those things where, and this other person is dealing with all this pain at that time. The irony of it is amazing to me. And I don't know if you ever do that with certain things where you, where was I at that time and how God brings people together. But at this point, they're brought together. Let's keep going in the story here. And though she spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, this, and I love, Peter is just always so great about that. Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in. Basically, everybody's touched you. Okay? But Jesus said, no, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. Now, think about that. The, the amazing. She just, and in her mind, all I need to do is just touch the fringe of his garment. And then at some point, who, the, when you think about Jesus, he's all-powerful. He's God. He's, he's the God-man. And the idea of, like, having a little bit of a relinquishment of power, I don't think it was that. It was just the acknowledgement that he knows Something has happened. And by the way, he knew who it was. But he wants her to come out. So he says, Someone touched me, for I perceive the power has gone out for me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And look at, listen to what Jesus says. And wouldn't you love to hear this as a daddy who loves your 12-year-old girl who wants her to get better? And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And so as he's watching this, is he thinking about the fact that, you know, I, I'm the ruler of the synagogue. That, and she, by the way, for those years, she couldn't go to the synagogue because she's unclean. 
Why? And so in his mind, I don't know. Uh, she used to go to, I don't, how long he's been the ruler of a synagogue? I don't know, but they've been in that town long. He probably knew what this woman's thing was. And this happens. And that's got to encourage his heart. That Jesus, if Jesus can heal her, I, I think I'm on the right track here. This whole crowd is moving toward Jairus' house. By the way, when things are going bad, I don't know if you want all those visitors. But he don't care. But back to us as dads. Dads, let your children see that you are a dad that invites Jesus into your home. He's not just some picture on your wall. He's a real person that you have a relationship with in your home. See, if you come to church every Sunday with a Bible, and I'd love for you to do that, but that's the only time that you open the Bible, that's not good. If they say, well, Dad brought his Bible to church, but they never see you open it Monday through Saturday, something's up. When you invite Jesus to be the Lord of your home, you're protecting your home, and that's your responsibility. Remember the Passover, Passover in Egypt? Remember what would happen there? Um, They were told that they had to have this meal And there was a representation that would be done where they would take the blood from the sacrifice and put it on the doorposts and on the lintel, okay? As a representation of this is covering our home. And the death angel would pass over the home as a result. It was the father's responsibility to do that. When we invite Jesus in our home, and we really invite Jesus in our home, we're protecting our home. Because you do know there's an angel of death that's passing through living rooms all over our country today, homes all over our country today. Are you aware of it? They'll breach the walls. They'll, they'll enter our homes, and if we're not careful with what we're watching and what we're listening to, whether it be televisions or computers or even these little mobile devices. So do you know about that? Are you aware of that instead of going, oh, just, you know, whatever? Um, Are you monitoring it? Are you watching over that? It's our responsibility. According to the Internet Filter Review, the largest consumer of Internet pornography is the age demographic between 12 years old and 17 years old. Doesn't stop there. Kids are terrorized on the Internet. One in 17 children, ages 10 to 17, are threatened or harassed over the Internet. One out of every five children has been propositioned on a home computer. So what we do when we apply the blood of Jesus over our homes... We're saying, not here. I'm going to be aware of that. And it's a battle. It's a battle. It's a fight. And it's worth the fight. Martin Luther says this, you can't stop birds from flying over your head, but you can certainly stop them from building a nest in your hair or on your head. I want to add to the quote. All right? <laughs> the devil would love to place, place a nest in your home. And I'm just wanting to encourage you. I will say more and more, it's for every one of us. Like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So let's make that our prayer. Dads, let's, let's be fervent about this. Well, let's keep going at the text here at verse 49. While he was still speaking, isn't it interesting that Jesus is constantly teaching, constantly teaching. Someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. 
Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him. I love it. This is so good. Do not fear. Only believe, and she will be well. And I want you to know this, too. When he says this, and I love this, in the same story, it's in the present indicative, and it's keep on believing. Or, in the words of Steve Perry, don't stop believing. All right. Don't stop believing this. Don't stop. Trust me, even as we keep walking. So he gets the news about his little girl, and he still wants Jesus in his home because he believes that the Lord has, can do something about it. Look at verse, or point number three is this, bestow love on your children. I don't think I have to say that too much because I see a group of people that are doing that. You'd love your children. I watch, I go to T-ball with, uh, as a grandpa, I show up at T-ball and I see these parents, they just love their kids. Just getting out there, doing it. Verse 51. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with them, which the people probably really appreciated, okay? This was a bunch of with them with them, except Peter and John and James. I, this, is, this is interesting. This is the first time in the Gospels where Peter, James, and John are separated from the rest of the group, and they are brought in. Okay, so he's mentoring here. He's teaching. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him knowing that she was dead. Now you might go, man, how did that switch so quickly? But do you do know that they would hire mourners? The, the, when they would do mourning, it's so different from how we do funerals. When they would walk into these places, there was a house of mourning. It was, there was wailing. There was just pain. It was very evident. When we walk into a funeral, it's very quiet, very dignified. These people are, and there are sometimes they would hire mourners to come in because they're like getting more people involved. I don't know what was going on here, but you wonder how real these people are with their mourning because they could switch on a dime. I don't be, I'd, I'd be mad. I don't think I'd be laughing. Okay? But Jesus is using a metaphor here that we've talked about before. We see this with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in John 11, 11 through 15. It says, After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And then we see Stephen after his stoning in Acts 7, 59 and 60. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so we see this picture that for the believer, for those that call on the name of Christ, we are going to be resurrected. We have that hope. And so falling, uh, passing away, dying is just a sleep. Uh, so she dies. Look at verses 40, 54 through uh, 56 as we wrap up here. But taking her by the hand, he's called out, called saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned and she got up at once and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Here's the deal. This whole episode was motivated by a father's love for his daughter. It was love that made him seek Jesus. It was love that made him invite Jesus home and risk his status and his standing. And we don't know how long she lived after that, but it's, if she lived a long life, every day, every single day, she would look back and go, my dad was willing to take steps so that I could have this hope. So when we bring, we'd bring our uh, children home for the very first time. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. For me, bringing a child home for the very first time 
was terrifying. And what was always weird to me is how easily Kim seemed to handle it. Like even picking up a baby. I'd pick up a baby and she'd go, would you put your hand under his head? I'd be like, it's like a bobblehead, you know. I'm gonna pick it up. And some of you are like, you should know that. There's certain people that just know that, all right? How did I learn? Time. I took the time. Back to, and you don't have to turn there, and we don't have to put it up on the screen, but back to the uh, Ephesians passage. It says, fathers, don't exasperate your children, but bring them up, and this is the part, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that takes time. That takes effort. So dad, let's be those that take the time to be what we ought to be in the power of Christ. That's my encouragement to you today.